Good evening. It's good to be here, man. Yes. How many of you guys tired? <laughs> all right, only a couple of you, man. All right, all right. In coffee injections, bro. <laughs> Legal. Uh, well, looks like the Lord has us here for another day. I wake up every morning and realize that. I think a lot of us do, huh? Well, Lord, you got us here. But I don't know what the thought is, why we think the Lord's coming at night all the time, you know? <laughs> like, I don't understand that. That'd be messed up because we'll all be sleeping and dreaming. We won't, we won't get to experience the whole, you know, daytime like that old Thief in the Night movie where the dude's mowing the lawn and he's gone. I always think the Lord's coming in the middle of the night, you know. But uh, it could be any moment these days, man. And that's a good thing. And, uh, but it's good to be here. Like, it's good to be around during this time. It's good to be uh, as sober-minded as we possibly could be in this time, you know. Uh, especially when uh, so much uh, confusion and turmoil um, is, is so, uh, it's out there. I mean, you know, with people we know and people we see. And so it's good to have people that are praying and seeking the Lord and wanting to live peaceably and to be able to share with others how to live that way. And that's you guys, you know, that's us. And, uh, but our hope and our knowledge and our understanding comes from the word and our experiences in life and our walk and journey with the Lord. That's how we learn. That's how we're able to share it with others. Um, so my prayer for you guys and myself is that God would use us in these days, in this time, and that uh, I know that's why you're here. You're here to be encouraged. You're here to grow uh, by the power of the word and then go out and, and watch how God's going to use you. And so it's such a blessing to be able to do that. And it's an honor for me to be with you guys to have a part in that in your life too. It's such a neat thing to see the body of Christ move. Um, so we are continuing in Exodus chapter 4. I, I love that we just stay steady on with the, the, uh, the scripture. And uh, tonight will be, I think, uh, the Holy Spirit is here for sure because Oscar's here tonight. So I think we're squared away. I pleaded with them to come because I wasn't sure what was going on, and now I know for sure that uh, no longer Ichabod, you know. So, uh, but join me, bros, as we pray real quick, as, as we open God's Word and read it together. Father, we, we pray for that clarity of mind, and Lord, that you would remove self, you would remove us in this moment, and you would replace us with your knowledge, with your words, what you have for us uh, in our lives personally today, uh, that we could be uh, a representation uh, of you in this flesh of ours, but being able to represent to somebody that we love or somebody that we know um, your goodness. And that's hard for us, Lord, because we feel so sometimes at turmoil, and we feel like we're not good representatives of you. <laughs> we feel, in fact, like we're inadequate uh, but Lord, your word tonight's going to show us what it is to, for those that feel inadequate and how you use us and, and those that you choose to use in these days. So Lord, speak to us tonight, encourage us to leave here and to go forward with power and with boldness and with excitement over what you're doing in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus name. Amen. So Exodus chapter four, we're going to read and uh, start at verse 10. Uh, we're moving pretty slowly through this chapter. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, one of those things. It's, we have to spend some time, especially in this portion of Scripture. I think as we move past chapter 4, we're going to see our reading kick up a notch a little bit. And I think the reason why I felt that it's probably pretty good to stay in chapter 4 is because this is the precursor chapter to the calling that God has placed on Moses' life. And so I'm always fascinated by that period of time, you know, right before God's about to do something in the lives of a person and the life of a person for the ministry or for God's purpose or for whatever, for, for what his calling is to you. He's got a lot of things to do with you before. And uh, a lot of things have to happen within us before we're able to go forward. And, uh, and that's, that's a tricky place to be. Uh, the transitions, again, I always call them 
the transitions of life, those, those spaces in life where, man, what's happening? What's going on? Why is God doing this? Why is this happening? You know, I'm a Christian or whatever, and things are just taking place. Well, that's a transition period in our lives. And there's so much meaning behind the transition periods of our life is why when we see scriptures like this, I love it. Because these are the scriptures that teach us what to do, uh, how to respond, how to view transition and, and change, how to see it in life. Uh, because God's got a plan in it, in the transition, in the change. And that's what we're seeing with Moses, talking to the burning bush, getting his instructions as to what God's going to have in store for him. And yet we're seeing all of these different things that God was wanting for him to learn just in this moment. We saw last time that we read through this, he had the leprous hand experience. He had the rod turn into a snake. And, and we got to see how God was revealing things to him that he was going to need to know. God's power before he goes forward into confronting Pharaoh about God's instructions for him. And we got to see the hand thing, the leprous hand, you know, which spoke to us heavy about flesh and so, literally our literal bodies. Okay, how God can change that, how God can cause things to take place even within our minds and in our bodies, but all for a purpose. All for a purpose to reveal things to us about self, about this tent that we're stuck in. <laughs> And how God uses that and how it's important to see that. And so after God reveals this to him about the rod, about how God could turn a stick into a snake, about how God can turn his flesh hand into a leprous hand and then heal it right after and all these things. Now Moses, is gonna, he's got something to say. He's going to now kind of dialogue with God, if you will, which I think many of us have done that in our lives. We've talked to God. And the, the cool thing about Moses in this instance that we're going to see is he's just keeping it real with God. He's just going to talk pretty straightforward. And, and for all, a lot of us, you guys remember, prayer is not always just, uh, talking to God is always not just this ritualistic thing. Just be real with God, man. Tell him straight up. That's the kind of relationship that we see those of the Old Testament have with God. And, and I think that's the kind of relationship that we should desire as well with him. Just a straight, real relationship. This is what's happening in my life, Lord. This is how I feel. And so let's check it out and see how Moses is going to start this conversation. Exodus chapter 4 at verse 10. It says, Now, and Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of slow tongue. Okay, here we go, man. We're going to dive into this. Here's God telling him all that he's going to do. All that he has set before him. And Moses' answer is, Lord, hold on for a second. Hold up. I got something to say. I'm not eloquent. I, I, I am slow of speech. I, I'm slow tongue. Uh, most of you probably have already read the scripture. You know what commentators have to say about this verse. A lot of commentators say that Moses possibly had a stutter. Okay. I don't know if he stuttered or not. Bottom line is we know this much. He's coming to God saying, look, I am not inadequate. I'm inadequate. I cannot do this. I have a physical problem, Lord, in case you haven't noticed. I got, I got something wrong with me. Okay? I am not fit for this calling that you're saying is my purpose. God, in case you haven't noticed, the path that you laid out for me in my life the shoe doesn't fit the foot. Okay, Lord, in case you didn't notice that, God. I like that because, you know, it says so much within that statement. There's so much within a person coming to God with this reality that we are not able to perform the duty or the calling or the ministry that God has set before us. There's, there's some reality check that happens in there. Now, I have to say this, and I know a lot of you guys probably can agree with this. Have you ever, in the time that you've been a Christian, the time that you've received the Lord or whatever, and God has either called you to ministry, called you to marriage, called you to be single, called you to whatever it is. Has there ever been a moment where you said, you know, I just, I'm just not meant for this. I am just not able to do this. I just can't. I'm limited 
in the things that God is asking me to do. And, and if you've ever been in that place, then guess what? You're in the same shoes as Moses. And in so many others in the scripture, and so many pastors, I'll tell you guys, I tell you guys, I share with you guys, I am an introvert, okay? You catch me in the hallway, I'm super quiet. I get tim I'm timid, I get intimidated by everybody. I recently told somebody, you're really intimidating to me, man. Like, you know, I, like, come on, man. I just want to chill. And, 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 and there's been so many times that I've said to the Lord, Lord, I cannot be a pastor. There's no way. I can't do it. I get too weird. I get too nervous. I remember when Jeff started having me teach in the main sanctuary. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I used to tell my wife, what am I doing? Who do I think I am? Who do, who do, well, this is wrong. There's something wrong with this. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not designed for this. I'm short. I'm bald. I don't look good like all these other pastors do. I don't dress like they do. Like, I, I, this is not for me. So many times I've, I've just said, and I've even remember telling them, I don't look like them. They got nice hair and all this stuff. I have no hair. You know, all these new guys that got cool hair dudes and everything. I don't have that. And I'm like, there's so many times I've just said, Lord, I, I, I can't do it. Just not my, not my thing. Not, not what I've been made for. And, and I know this happens on so many other levels too, though. Even in marriage or even having children. Lord, I can't be a dad. I, I, I'm failing. And I know so many brothers who have experienced that. I'm failing my daughter. I'm failing my son. I'm failing my wife. So many, I'm failing the guys, you know. They don't know that I'm just not meant for this, you know. And it's interesting because... As we're seeing here in the early stages of a man like Moses who was used in one of the most tremendous capacities in the Bible. When dialoguing with God about his calling, the first thing he says is, I'm not able. I have some limitations, by the way, Lord, in case you haven't noticed. I can't talk right, but yet you want to send me as a speaker. What kind of, what kind of game, what kind of trickery is this, God? <laughs> you know, what, what kind of game are you playing with me here, Lord? It's like me, again, I'm only 5'5". Five, five. You want me to go play basketball? What kind, of, what kind of game are you playing here with me, Lord? You know, this, is, this doesn't work. So crazy, man. When you think about the reality of what really Moses is saying, it really runs deep. And we all can really identify it to some degree. Just not able to do it. How about, how about just being a Christian? Oh, let me add something to that. How about being a Christian man in, in our time today? All of us own cell phones. Most of us have smartphones. Let me say that's a challenge in itself. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Okay. How about the reality of just being a Christian man today? Lord, I, this, is, this is crazy hard. How, how are we supposed to remain pure? I'm gonna, I think some of us have decided at some point in our Christian lives, let's just be like the priest. Let's put blindfolds on and just walk around that way so we don't sin. <laughs> you know, there's things we need to do here, man. We are, we are limited we are faulty, if you will. Oh, gosh, I've, I remember some nights I've, I just said that to the Lord. Lord, I got gl I'm a glitch. I got problems up in my head. <laughs> I do. I do. You know, I do. I got issues, man. I share them with you sometimes. There's been times up here when I've shared with you guys that I'm, I, I've, I've, st I've thought to myself while I'm teaching, am I, what am I talking about? You know, like, am I even making any sense to these guys? And sometimes I see some of you guys looking at me going, see, he, he's looking at me like I'm nuts. Am I saying anything right now? Or, or I see somebody nodding out and go, see, I'm boring these guys to death right now. You know what I mean? I've done, I've done this, man. These are things that happen regularly. God, I'm, I'm inadequate. I've got issues. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 you know, I'll start at verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says, For ye see your calling, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many, many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And he's chosen the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. See, the Bible tells us here that in fact the way we might view strength, the way we might see like the children of Israel when they said, well, what kind of king do we want? 
Well, I'll go pick the nine footer. Who wouldn't want that king? Look at that dude. He's a beast. You know, I want to, he's my fullback. That's who I'm going after. You know, I'm going behind him. Who's our king? Well, man, it's traditional that men pick off of what they look like. I hate to say it. You know, they pick off of what you see. If you guys were about to get, throw down with somebody in the parking lot, wouldn't you look for the biggest bro to back you up? You're not going to look for that little dude. Like, what is it? bro, we have some big dudes up ahead of us. I always, tell, I always tell my kids about this story. I had this little friend who was a real skinny dude and small. Uh, he, he started throwing down with some, some, uh, um, some Samoan dude. And I was like, dude, this Samoan dude's going to crush my, my friend. Wait, okay, uh, let's go BC. I'm going be, before Christ days for a minute, okay? We were all at some club, and we started fighting with the security guards. And, and I threw my beer in the bush. They weren't going to let me into the thing. And I'm like, what? You know? Anyway, it started a big old fight with all the security guards. And the main one was a Samoan dude. And my skinny little friend couldn't even get anything on him. But he was, kept jumping up and headbutting this dude. Just jumping up and headbutting him over and over and over and over until the guy's head cracked and started just bleeding right in the middle of it. And I remember going, see, that's why my little buddy right there, just this power right there, man. You know what I mean? That's my people right there. But we traditionally as men, we go and say, you know, I'm going to, you know, make this call based off of how things look. The children of Israel did it, do it all the time. Unfortunately, uh, uh, church uh, uh, boards, the, the Baptists do it, you know. They want the nice, you know, looking guy teaching, the gray-haired, nice, full set of hair, suit guy, you know. They, a lot of the times, people pick off of what it looks like. And that, you know, what can you do about that, man? We're human. That's our world. It's all about looks. But, you see, the scripture tells us here that God actually doesn't work that way at all. At all. <laughs> he works, according to this scripture, the opposite of that. He says, I'm going to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I'm going to use those that feel like they don't have what it takes. You know, to, I'm going to use those that, that are humbled. You know, because I'm not sitting here saying that God doesn't use good looking guys, by the way. You know what I'm saying? We're not offing all the guys with nice hair. Scott has the nicest set of hair I know. I've taken him to mission trips before. I, and believe me on this, that hair doesn't move. Even after shower, he comes out of the shower and it's poof. Okay, so we've been places all through the world. That was in the Philippines, I think. And we learned that, you know, God uses good-looking guys like Scott. And, 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 and that's truthful. So I'm not, I'm not saying you got to be butt ugly for God to use you or, 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 or dumb. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that. Uh, God uses, it's the heart. You see, it's the heart. It's the one who says, you know, I don't think this way. Lord, I, I, I need help. You know, I'm, I'm, God has humbled me for whatever to whatever capacity that's taken place. And he's saying he uses those to confound the wise. And here's Moses like, I can't even talk right. And you want to send me to Pharaoh, the ruler of the kingdoms of the world, who they call God, the Pharaohs were God. You want me to go talk to this guy? And not only that, you want me to make demands too? Like, you know, you want me to demand things from him? You know, I'm going to go, 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 stutter, Lord, when I go up to him and talk about, you know, let my people go. Like, how can I do this? I don't even, he's saying, I got a stuttering problem. But God's saying to us, it's the, the weak, the, it's those that realize their ability to not, we're not perfect. <laughs> the, one of the, one of the greatest characteristics I've learned as, as being in the church and being a pastor and being in ministry, uh, you meet those guys. You meet those people who are just genuinely humble. And you just go, my gosh. <laughs> like, that has to be a work that God has done in that person's life. To make somebody just realize, you know, I, I don't have what it takes. Man, we're, we're all just, and you know, I got to say this. And I'm not, you know, this is me not kissing up or whatever. But Pastor Jeff, to me, is a very humble person. I've gotten to know him through the years. Jeff and I work side by side. We've been working side by side for over, I think now, eight years where I'm directly with him. It's him and I making a lot of calls and stuff in the church. And, and I've asked him so many times, like, Jeff, you know, I, I kind of go back, take him back to his old days when they started the church from the park and to the small building and to the theater and all this and that. And Jeff, no matter what, no matter how much I want to dig in and get some, like, advice, his answer's always been, I don't know why God used me. <laughs> I was just some hippie running naked in the jungle, smoking weed, doing whatever I did, and God saved me and just decided to use me. 
And, you know, I, I, I receive that because it makes me feel like God can use me. <laughs> you know, it makes me kind of go, man, that's cool. <laughs> because, you know, I was like, you know, I was striving, man, reading all kinds of books. And I, I was in the Bible college thing and reading every theological thing I could think of and, and just trying to really aspire to, to fit this place that God put me in. But the reality is, is I, I'm here only because God said that I'm going to use you and don't, don't get a big head. <laughs> And you're nothing. <laughs> and, like, and that's okay. I use the foolish things. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, the weak, something dead, if you will, is easier to use, right? <laughs> Think about that. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, what, you know the, the, they always show when somebody's drowning and, and, and they try to go save them. You probably just want to knock them out because they're, they're flapping around so much that they're drowning you now. But when you knock them out or when they're finally done and exhausted, you can save them. You know, and it's like the same concept. Like it's easier to use something that's dead. Something that doesn't fight back. Something that just realizes that I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm nothing. And 2 Corinthians 12.9 is my, I guess you could say it's, you know, they say, do you have a life scripture? I say, this is my life scripture. And it says, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So when you come down to this reality that you're weak or you don't have the ability to, or whatever that is, or, or you just come to this place where you find yourself saying, you know, man, I, 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 I can't live up to these standards as a believer. Honestly, I just can't. The Bible tells me to be holy as he is holy. Well, Lord, you picked the wrong guy because I can't be holy, <laughs> you know, or the, or, or they tell me that, you know, as a Christian, you need to, you know, you didn't live this way and that way. And, you know, and, and, and all these things. And you just go, you know, then maybe I shouldn't be because I just can't do it. I remember the first time I was so excited when Jeff and I went somewhere and I put on the Beatles and he goes, oh, I love this song. I go, oh, see, okay, the Beatles are cool. First, I had to feel like I had to get rid of them. And then, you know, you start going, hey, wait a minute. You know, like, we're just people. We're, we're just people. Love a little classic rock here and there. Good with that. A little country here and there. Some of the hip hop's kind of, eh. you know, nowadays, the music thing. But I remember when I first got saved, it was like, I felt like I had a mold into something that was like this idea of Christian. And, then I, and I started learning, like, first of all, yes, you do. You, you have to change from your old ways into your new ways. And, and you got to give it a shot. But it's going to be by God's strength and the Holy Spirit's power and by God's timing that we mold into the image of Christ that he has for all of us. You can't strive for that. You can't rush that. It's going to be different for everybody. And the problem we find is that people start rushing others. Like, and and you, you're in a group meeting or something and one brother's telling you just all the different things he's doing and how amazing you know, the Lord's using them, and you're sitting there going, man, what am I doing wrong, man? You know, uh, and, and the reality is, is it, God works differently in every one of our lives. He's given each and every one of us a measure of gifts and a measure of strength and a measure of faith, all different. We're going to end up in one direction one day, one the same place. But we have to understand that, man, Lord, just have your way in my life. You work things out in your timing in my life. Don't rush that. Because if you rush it, guess what happens? You're striving. And if you're striving and you perfect it, then you're going to strive to maintain that position you created. Not the one that God naturally did in your life. And so he says, my strength, the way I'm powerful in you, the way I'm able to use you, okay, the way everybody says we need to be used in these last days. Well, the way that's going to happen, if we remain weak, then he becomes strong. Simple. It's really simple. And Paul, further in this scripture, goes on to say in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says in verse 10, so because Paul understands this and, he, and it clicks in his brain, he goes and says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. <laughs> therefore, because I understand that God's only strong when I'm weak, guess what? I'm going to boast in my infirmities then. I'm going to take pleasure in that. That's some backwards thinking, isn't it? That's, that's crazy thinking right there, man. But it's real thinking. 
if then by the nature of what's happening to me in my life is making me weak and it's making me feel and it's making me hurt or it's making me look at myself in a, in a, in a weird way and, and not in a prideful way or in a humble way, then guess what? I'm going to receive that infirmity. I'm going to take it. I'm going to say, you know what? Then the Lord have your, your way. I learned throughout my trial in my life, this thing that I felt was a glitch in my brain, <laughs> this thing that I felt was, was actually, I felt it was, it was keeping me from ministry because, I, because of what was happening to me. I've, I've learned that, no, well, the Lord let it happen because what it's doing is it's making me weaker as, as I get older. And, and that just means, God, that I'm going to believe you're becoming stronger. So as long as I continue to die, as long as I continue to see self hurt, because it only hurts when it's alive. That's it. Hey, you ever been poked in a really numb spot? You know, I'm, you know, that's, and you don't feel nothing. It's like those guys who can't feel one leg. They let the kid stab their leg over and over, you know, because they don't feel it. <laughs> the kid trips out. Oh, what? <laughs> you know, they don't feel it. If it's numb, you don't feel it. But if it's alive, you feel it. And God knows the parts of our flesh that's alive. He does. And he carefully, with a scalpel, begins to remove it. And it hurts. And then you start to realize the pain is good. Because you say, man, this pain, this, what I'm feeling, this removal of my strength. You know, and that's where I, I've shared oftentimes that my strength that I found in the past was my knowledge. I used to feel like, man, I can read a hundred books and retain them all. <laughs> and, and, and I used to kind of boast in that. And then when, it start, when I started to be affected by what was happening to me, I felt like I was losing my strength. Like, how, man, what's going to become of me after five or ten years from now? I'm not going to be able to remember anything, you know. And I'm, and I'm not going to be able to, to, to be able to be the strong person that I, I always thought I was, relying on my abilities to, to, to memorize things and to retain information and all this stuff. But I, and I, and I was, it was freaking me out because I was like, going, what's going on? But you start to learn as a believer, well, that's good because God's changing your source of strength. You're now becoming dependent on him and less dependent on yourself. And that's God's will. That's his will for every one of us in this room, that we would become dependent on him and less dependent on ourselves. And that's why the concept of death in the Bible is so profound. The very common verse I love is Galatians 2.20. It's just one page over. Galatians 2.20. Very gnarly verse if you really let it go into your brain and sink in. But very heavy when you understand it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I don't live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh. This one that I have to stare at in the mirror. I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul goes on to say in this Galatians 2.20 that we died. We, we had a spiritual death. And we no longer live. And, and he's, he, he camps on this concept of weakness and death for a reason, right? Notice Paul has this a part of his conversation all day long. I mean, and he must have been a bummer. Walking around trying to encourage people, telling them, just die, man. What? Yeah, just die. You're weak, man. What? Man, you're, get out of here. You're a bummer, man. You're ruining the party. You know, just telling everybody, oh, it's so good to be weak and, and dumb and, you know, whatever, foolish and abase and dead. All, all these words, they're, they equal boring and dark. They equal uh, not positive. <laughs> you know, today's whole thing of psychology just being so... You know, positive thinking, you know, speak to you, the universe something positive and let it sort of like, what's the word? Uh, not synergistic, but um, not meaningful purpose, but uh, synchronization. Just, it, it'll, it'll just, you know, the speaking it out will just bring it back good, man. Yeah, not, not with Paul. Not with Paul. Paul says, speak forth death. Speak forth foolishness. Abase things. These are the things that God uses so backwards. But it's because he learned. He learned that this tent of a body was not meant to be strong. And that's why, for those of you old guys in here, you'll be the first one to say, 
It ain't fun getting old. What does Jeff always say? It, getting old is not for the, the weak hearted. <laughs> because, and I, you know, and, you know, I feel like I'm, I got a 60 year old mind and my 40 year old body, you know, and I'm like, oh, you know, I, I get dizzy when I walk now. And a lot of older guys are like, that's every day for us, man. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is messing me up, bro. <laughs> I'm only 41, and I get dizzy when I walk, and, you know, I, I have to take it slow down the stairs. My wife's like, what are you, 65? I'm like, take it easy. I can't see good at night anymore, you know? I got night blindness and all this stuff, man. I'm like, what's going on, man? Our, our bodies are just naturally dying, <laughs> some earlier than others, you know? It's a bummer. But notice, though, it's designed that way. After the fall of man, we were no longer meant to live eternal in this tent. This tent now becomes something that's passing away and meant to dissipate and die eventually. And it's so neat how the story of life actually, in, in some metaphorical way, says that. You know, you're born as a baby, you know, and all this stuff. You grow, you have your midlife, you, you start going, getting older, and, and then you die, and then you're in eternity with the Lord as a believer. And thus, you're in the most glorified and strongest position of your entire existence. And so the story of life models that. It models this, this aging process that says the older we get, the weaker we become. But hey, the less you rely on yourself. And that's why old guys are all spiritual all the time. <laughs> I mean, the older they are, the more spiritual they are. You know? And if you're not spiritual as an old guy, then you got, I don't know, God's got something else for you, man. <laughs> you know? and, and it's like, Lord, show us that. Allow that to happen in our lives uh, naturally. Let us see how death and foolishness and weakness is a good thing, you know? Afflictions, they're good. Like Paul said, I'll boast in my infirmity then. I'll receive that affliction because it's just making me less dependent on myself. And so feeling inadequate here in Moses is in our back to our thinking of our scripture. It's almost like a prerequisite for ministry <laughs> and to be used by God. God naturally strips away all of who we are to fill us with his strength. That's what happens. He strips away all of who we are to fill us with his strength. If you feel like you're being stripped away tonight of something of who you are, if you feel like God's been taking something from you, you're losing some part of your manhood, or maybe you're just feeling like, man, I'm just getting weaker or something. I, I thought the Bible said I'm supposed to become stronger, you know, as a Christian. Well, know this, you're in good company. And just know this, whatever is being stripped away from you is being replaced by something that God has for you and some kind of strength, not of your own. And he will be a present help in time of need. When you need that, you're going to be blown away when you need that. I was talking to a brother of mine this morning who recently lost his mom a few days ago to COVID. And he's just really hurting, obviously. And he's like, he's been a Christian since he's a kid. He comes to this school. He works here and all with us. And uh, he said to me, I've known scripture my whole life, you know. And uh, when he lost his mom, he really took it hard. And uh, he said, uh, I got a text from somebody that just said, don't forget about your word. You know, because he's like, I wasn't even in my word. I'm just like, whatever. And I'm mourning, you know, which is fine. And he said, though, so that he goes, I did one of these, you know, okay, God, speak to me things. That's what he did. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And he goes, and he goes, and I'll tell you what happened, bro. God spoke to me. And I went to Psalms, whatever, whatever, and it talked about I'm being drowned by all life and all this stuff. And it was, and it was exactly how I felt, man. And, it, and, it, and the Lord showed me, I know how you're feeling right now. And, and he, he just said, wow, man, like the word spoke to me through this, through this, this hard time of my life. This, this, you know, seeing God come at a present help in time of need. It's when we need it. It's when we need that strength. It's when he, he appears. Because sometimes we're, we're going through it and we're like, I need you, I need you, I need you. But you know, you really don't. You're just being needy. <laughs> but when you need it, in that moment, he'll show up. You see, God, I've always, I've always told people, I've always taught my kids that you don't get the Bible and you don't do this. And then the genie comes out and says, well, I, what three issues would you like? <laughs> you know, that's not God. I tell my kids, you don't get the Bible. You don't use it that way. It's not an idol. It, this is the word of God. It, actually, let me rewind. This is just a book, first of all, with a bunch of words. Okay, but when, when God in his spirit empowers us to receive and understand what he's trying to say, it's different. See, but he's not a genie. We, we fill ourselves with his word. 
We study it as the scripture tells us to. But when he's ready in his timing, in his perfect timing, when we are at our weakest and we're at that moment, he will come up. He'll show up. And he'll reveal to you the things like the scripture says that the Holy Spirit will reveal the things that Jesus has taught you. Not a genie. Kind of a bummer. I wish he was. <laughs> you know. So check this out. Verse 11. Back to our scripture. Exodus chapter 4 now. So here's Moses. I'm slow of speech. I can't talk. I'm weak. And as we see, hey, man, amen to that. <laughs> you know, uh, Look at now uh, in verse 11. I love this scripture. And the Lord said unto him. So here's God's response now. Who hath made man's mouth? <laughs> or who maketh the dumb or deaf? Or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? This is Moses. I get what you're saying, man. You're coming to me about your problems and all this stuff, about your, 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 your sort of your ailments, or whatever you want. You, you, Moses, you got, a, you got a disability of some sort. You're coming. Who, ha, who made you? <laughs> let, let me remind you of something here. So the first thing I want to say, guys, before I get into breaking the scripture down, is when you are in a time of doubt, when the enemy is pressing hard on your mind, Convincing you, as he will eventually, if he has not already, he will soon, that you're inadequate. You have to go and say, Lord, speak to me, but say, Lord, remind me that you're my creator. You know, I remember one night I was struggling with something and uh, some, you know, the, the doctors and all, they say these are brain chemical problems or whatnot. And I remember thinking, um, uh, well, the Lord raised up Lazarus, like, just like that. I mean, this dude, all his nerve endings were dead. His blood wasn't flowing in his veins. You know, I went all medical on it. I'm like, his heart wasn't beating. There was no, no, those little brain energy things simultaneously moving without his neurons. Nothing was happening, and he was a dead body. And then in a voice, Jesus speaking, saying, come forth, fired up all of those things in his whole biology, <laughs> of who he is as a human being. His neurons fired up. His blood cells started pumping. You know, the red and the white ones were balanced and all these crazy and all these things happened in his body. And he gets up and he's alive. And I remember thinking to myself, did I forget that? Jesus could just speak and all of a sudden I could just, if he said, Phil, you're six foot tall, poof, I'd be six foot tall. Just like that. Hair, poof, just like that. He could do it just like that. And, and, or, or whatever that might be. Even if it's something more serious. Some people going through health issues. Guess what? He could just speak the word because he created it. And boom, it's done. Just like he said. All he said. And he didn't even say, neurons, fire up to Lazarus. He didn't say that. He, he didn't say, Adams, wake up. No, he just said, Lazarus, come out. Instantly, his body that was dead came to life. And so, reminding ourselves. Let the spirit remind us. That God is the creator is something refreshing, by the way. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so notice here what's happening. Am I, I create you. I, am, I make this scene, you know, the blind. This is, this is the Lord. What I do, Moses, what we're about to talk about, Moses, and for us here tonight, God's going to, he's going to say to him, listen, um, I'm in the business let me just throw that term out for a moment. God's going to say, I'm in the business of recreating things. I, I, I recreate things. You guys all know the term born again, right? We all know the term born again. Unbelievers can't stand it because it sounds so silly. What do you mean you're born again? Sometimes we feel embarrassed even saying that. Yeah, I'm a born again person. Because it's like, what? You're born again? That make, that's weird. But, but let's look at that for a minute. Being born again actually means... To be recreated. To be recreated. Okay? And what we're seeing here is God's going to explain here. And what he's really, in a sense, telling them is, I take who you are now. And Moses up to this point, does anyone remember how old he is? Huh? Huh? 80. That's a long time. Anybody in here 80? Raise your hand. Dennis? Dennis? Where you at, bro? No? Okay, you're not 80 yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to let up on Dennis. Uh 80 years old is a long time, kind of, right? To be who you are, to, to, to uh, and this is a desert man, by the way, right? Out in the dirt, okay? He's probably got really rugged feet, all right? 
uh, probably tan, always in the sun all the time. Uh, he's, he's defined is what I'm trying to say. And what God's going to really show him in this is, I'm going to recreate you. You're messed up. You're a little bit thwarted. But I recreate people. I make people born again. You see, I take who you are at your point in your life. And I change that person. Literally. Look it over in Romans chapter 12. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing, you see, renew, recreate, born again. God renews, he recreates. So we come to God with this uh, of who we are in our condition. Okay, that's who we are. We can't help, we are products of our environment to some degree. It's who we are. We live in L.A. County, busy, crazy place. You know, some of us got gnarly jobs. It does a wearing on your mind. It does, you can't help it. Some of us are, you know, we get, what, what, what's going on in our lives affects us is what I'm trying to say. So we think, okay, well, God, here I am, you know, this is who I am. Uh, you know, I'm kind of messed up. I'm a busy person. God says, well, see, uh, I recreate you. So don't come to me with some old trash bag, okay? Because I take the trash bag and I turn it into something else. I recreate you. I, I, I reestablish who you are, even in how you think. And that's what he says here. That's what Paul's emphasizing. That word in the Greek, uh, uh, renewing uh, uh, of the mind, really means, literally, to make new. So that means God is taking our minds, our bodies, or whatever, for whatever capacity they want to use us, our speech, our abilities, and he's going to recreate them to fit the calling that he has in your life. He's going to recreate you. He's going to transform you. To fit the purpose that he has for you in this life. He is. That's what he does. And that's what he's trying to tell Moses. I'm going to make your old mind. Or that, that's programmed a certain way. Into something new. And something different. That's like for the guy. I don't know if you were like me when I got saved. How many of you guys never cried before? All of a sudden you get saved. And you're crying to every worship song. What happened? How did that even happen? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're able to tolerate a Bible study on a Thursday night after a long day at work. When at, before, you used to, you're the guy that knocked out at 6 o'clock, you know? And now here you are, taking notes and all these kinds of things. Singing, you know. Guys, that just didn't happen, okay? How many of you guys back in your days with all your bros in school or whatever just sat around singing with each other all the time out loud? Some of you guys are like, I did. I'm like, okay, my bad. You, know, you guys are in the choir or whatever. <laughs> That's cool. But how many of us did these things, right? Sat at tables and, and, you know, hey, man, I'm just really struggling right now. You know, man, I just need help. How many of you guys did that? You, you, you don't look at the small things, but we forget sometimes that the things we're doing today are not things we would have done before. How many of you guys just, just read? <laughs> you know, some of you, some of you, I never read, you know, I've never read before or whatever, man. I never picked up no book, especially the same one over and over and over and over. You know, what? all of a sudden, you know, see, we don't always look at those things. But when you spend time to take a look at, at what's happening in your life today, you find that you already, in, in a way, have been recreated. <laughs> you, you have, you have a, you've, something happened. And, and so, so with that said, we have, to, we have to be encouraged and understand that that recreation process, according to the scripture, happens the rest of our lives. You see? As he says in the rest of that verse we read, the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The will of God for your life. You're going to be able to prove that. Live it. And it's going to be acceptable by God. As he transforms you and as he recreates who you are. And, and then we become different. This to me is... The perfecting of the saints. That's what that word, that's what this is to me. It's the perfecting of the saints. It's the true testimony of God in all of our lives. To take who you were, life, its trials, situations, events, the calling that he has 
from one person as who you think you are to a new person, the one he's making you to be. This to me is the true perfecting of the saints. And it's happening in every one of our lives today. There's a reason why all of a sudden you care for something you never cared about in your life. There's a reason why you all of a sudden want to be a good dad. There's a reason why you want to be a good husband. There's a reason why you want to watch what you say. <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, you used to have a pot, just the mouth like crazy. Now all of a sudden you're like, oh, Lord, what did I say? You know, you go and lash yourself for saying the S word. You know, take it easy. You're being renewed. You're being changed. It's okay. It takes a little time. But you start to see all these different things that you're convicted over now. That's the transformation. It's a, it's a great transformation. It's actually beautiful when you think about it. It's God's plan. It's, his, it's his, one of his most amazing qualities to take even our minds, man, and make them into what he wants them to be. To perfect you. And, and this is, now by the way, for his glory, not ours. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm not six feet tall with a new set of hair. Because that's my glory. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, you know. No, no, no. It ain't about me. It's about him. It's not about us. It's about him. And so what he's doing in our lives is ultimately going to result in him receiving glory for what he's done in your life. And you start to realize the true meaning of being born again. And then, and then you're able to say it with confidence. I'm born again, man. Seriously. Because I was not thinking like that before. Most of the time that conversation comes up when you're fighting. I wanted to fight somebody. You better be glad I'm born again, bro. Because before, back in the day, it'd be on. You know, like, it, we'd be throwing them right now, man. You know, me and the boys. Well, you're born again. You're, you're, he's recreating you. To, <laughs> you're there. Some of you say, well, he says, turn the other cheek, man. You know, let's do this. No. See, you start to see you become soft. You do. You become soft. You want to hug someone, bro. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I got a new friend now. We got a new pastor here. Uh, Art Reyes. He, we brought him on staff. The guy hugs me all the time. I always say, get off me, man. Stop hugging me so much, bro. I'm not like that. You know, rubbing my arm and junk. I'm like, God, during prayer. He's the guy during prayer that's doing this. I'm like, stop already, man. What are you doing to me? I'm not there, okay? <laughs> Come on, bro. I'm over the men's ministry, bro. You, you, you keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to do what I do, you know. It's, it's the transformation, man. We're different people. We're different people, you know? And, 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 and we see that there is deep meaning behind these changes. And, and going back to our scripture, uh, the deep, deep meaning behind what's happening in Moses' life it's because he's going to be sent to set the children of Israel free from bondage. And, and he's going to be used by God to set forth a, an amazing story that follows the rest of this whole book. This man has a calling, one of the greatest callings ever, man. But some of the things that have to happen in, in, in his perception of his reality, they have to change up here like they do for all of us. We have to have the same perception, the same reality checks that we're inadequate, just like Moses. We, we go through affliction and trial, just like Paul, but he's strong when I'm weak and he takes these foolish things that are in me and he uses them for his glory to, to confound the wise, to change lives, to do things that I had never thought I would be doing or to do things that I would never be capable in my own strength of doing for his glory. For his, for his purpose. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you for the testimony of your word. And that we can see the power of your Holy Spirit. Even actively involved in our lives, Lord. And, and just seeing the, the change. And, and to see the, the work you're doing in our lives. And, and Lord, we, who are we, Lord? We're, we're, we're your humble servants, Lord. And, and Lord, if we, if we have a, a, a thing about humility, then our prayer is humble us. And then give us the strength to endure. Give us the perception. Give us the, the reason and logic to understand that our weaknesses only bring forth your strength. And so, Lord, we thank you for this night. We pray, Lord, that in this time that we gather together and, and fellowship and talk about the things going on in our lives, that it would be fruitful. And that the goal of our conversation would be is to see uh, you, your testimony, and your work uh, moving in our lives. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you, man.